In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first sentence that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married with him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn child, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger, because there was no room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Thanks. Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. Thanks for coming out on Christmas Eve. It was really good to hear the strings and to have a little skit and gosh, I wish we'd have those things a little more often. So those are very special. I appreciate that. And to sing a song that I have never heard before. That was, that was pretty cool. Learn something new. Well, welcome uh, to Emmanuel Baptist Church. Um, uh, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Steve Ruffner and I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, I'm glad that you have come out to celebrate Christmas with us. Um, and we do this really because Christmas is a special time, but even like was said in the skit, that, and, and if you want to quote the Grinch, that there is more to Christmas. And we don't really get to realize what that more is unless we are here together we are looking into God's word, and we are able to really see what the true meaning of Christmas is about. Because it is, it's, we, we like to celebrate things. We have memories, we have nostalgia. But there is more than just looking back and, and, and those few things that tie us to the past. Or even just to an event that happened 2,000 years ago that ties us to the past. Christmas is looking forward, and it's anticipation, it's hope as Galen talked about as he was reading the Old Testament um, prophecies. But one thing we see in, in the Christmas stories, um, there's this, this little theme that appears a number of times, and, and Greg alluded to this this past Sunday, if you were here with us, but in the story where the angel came and talked to Zacharias, and he saw the angel, his initial response was fear, and the angel's response to him was, don't be afraid. And then again with Mary, the angel said, don't be afraid. And then in the passage that Darcy just read with the shepherds, he said, don't be afraid, fear not. Now certainly, part of that was in those circumstances to see an angel out of nowhere, uh, something that you wouldn't expect, something you've never seen before, something just out of the blue would frighten you. 
And there's certainly a, a part of the fear not in there that is tied to just that moment. Like, all right, I'm not here to hurt you. Don't be afraid. It's going to be okay. But I think there's more to the fear not in that. To, there's more to this don't be afraid, especially when it comes to us thinking about what Christmas is all about. So what are the things that you fear? You know, could it be that you fear not having enough money? Could you be afraid about what other people think about you? Is it a fear of public speaking or flying? You know, some people didn't travel this year because they didn't want to get on the plane. Is it a fear of being away from home or fear of spiders? Is it a fear of failure or rejection? What about a fear of losing a loved one? Or a fear of embarrassment or disgrace? You know, the, the angel in Matthew chapter 1 told Joseph to don't be afraid to take Mary home to be your wife because there was probably a little bit of fear of disgrace going on in there. You know, in our current culture, there's probably a lot of us who have a bit of a fear of COVID. Or maybe it's a fear of taking the vaccine, just getting the shot. There's fear in that. Fear of pain. Fear of dying. These are all common fears. But the question is, what tends to alleviate our fears? And if we look to our culture sometimes, sometimes it's just, you know, we hear things like, well, you just have to face your fears. Just Go do it. Or sometimes we deal with our fears with humor. You know, if we, if we can laugh it off, then maybe we can get through it. Or my favorite is just denial. <laughs> you know, just, if I forget about it, if I don't talk about it, I don't address it, if I bury my head, head in the sand, I don't have to worry about my fears. But really, the thing that gets us through our fears it's probably one of two things. It's good news, like in the passage that we just read when the angel said, don't be afraid for I bring you good news of great joy. I mean, think about that the fear of losing a loved one who might be in the hospital and they're waiting for a, you know, a diagnosis for cancer or something and they come back and the, fear, and the doctor says, Good news. The test was negative. Good news alleviates fear. I think another thing that, that alleviates fears is the presence of another person. I mean, think about this. Just last week or two weeks ago, my daughters were in a piano recital. And my daughter, Evie, who, as some of you know, she's a social butterfly. She, she will talk to anybody. You know, there's, she knows no strangers. But this was her second piano recital, and she was dreadfully afraid of being up there on playing the piano. And so what did she do? She's like, Darcy, come up here with me and sit with me. And so Darcy went up with her. And so Evie, sitting on the piano bench with Darcy, was grabbing onto Darcy with one arm and playing jingle bells with the other hand. But it was that presence of another person that helped her through that. You know, I think about when I was a kid, and I'm not talking about uh, Halloween is a, a, you know, a good thing on Christmas, but you know, I, I was afraid, I didn't like haunted houses or things like that. But I would do a haunted house if my dad went with me. You know, if I had my dad that's person I knew who was good and safe, who was going to be with me. And that's true of a lot of us. When we want to face something, we want to face our fears. It's not just going through it. It's being with another person. And that's what makes Christmas so special. It's because not, it's, it's not just about good news. But as Galen read earlier, the, with Isaiah 7.14, is that the Savior that was born 
is God with us. He is with us. Just as much as Darcy holding on to Evie while Evie is playing the piano, or my dad holding on to me and going through it, that God is with us through every step of our life. And it's not just that moment in time when the eternal God stepped into time and space and history. It's not just that moment when he came as a baby, as a human, to rescue us from our fears and from our sin. But that he's with us all the time. He's with us now. It's not just the looking back to 2,000 years ago. And it's all throughout Scripture, too. First Peter tells us to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. We cast our cares on the Lord, and he will sustain us. That's a verse from Psalm 55. A verse that I know a lot of us love is Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And later on in Luke, he writes, Jesus said this, that peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. That's why we celebrate Christmas, because God came into this world. Yes, it's a miracle that he came as a baby, and I don't understand that. But he came to save us and to be with us. So don't be afraid. For God is with us and we truly have nothing to fear. But I'll say this, there's one important caveat to that. It's not just the nostalgia of celebrating the event. It's not just the birth of a baby. Because truly for God to be with us and to alleviate our fears where God's promise of peace and forgiveness of sin and of hope and all that that only comes to those who have put their faith and their trust in Jesus. It's not just an acknowledgement of his birth. Not just an ascent that he came and he lived and he died. He lived his sin, sinless life. And he died a sacrificial death to pay the penalty for, for our sins there on the cross. Just as we sang in a little town of Bethlehem, be born in us today. It's accepting that into us. That his promises of all the other things can come true. Which is why it is an appro appropriate thing for us to come and on a Christmas Eve service to celebrate communion together. Because not only are we thinking about and celebrating the birth of a baby, but we are looking forward and looking ahead to what that baby lived and died to do. And so in a moment, we're going to take communion together. And you are welcome to take communion with us. Uh, here at Emmanuel, we, we do what we call open communion. So if you have trusted Christ as your Savior... Um, doesn't matter if you're a member here or not. And we invite you to do this. And so in a moment, uh, the worship ensemble is going to come up again and they're going to play for us. Um, uh, and we have two sets of tables, one on each side. Uh, what I want to invite you to do is to just go over to a table. There will be people there to give you the bread and the cup. And then come back to your seats uh, and then listen meditatively, prayerfully listen uh, as they play. And then we will take communion together uh, after that. So pray with me. Father, thank you that you love us enough to come to this earth as a baby. The eternal God coming as an infant. 
And that boggles my mind. And that is something that we can look back and celebrate. But at the same time, God, we, we look ahead. We also celebrate what you did for us. The reason you came is so that you could save us. So that we can experience your presence with us. So, so Father, thank you. And we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go ahead. uh, uh, I know it'll be a little unorderly, but go ahead and head to the sides and